I was talking with uh, Kiel Mo, who was uh, <clears throat> speaking at our school here, and he was uh, relaying to me a story about um, a, um, a seminar he was at. He was part of a panel that was discussing resilience and climate change. And it became pretty clear that the climate scientists on the panel were kind of snickering at the design professionals. <laughs> Finally, one of them said, you know, you guys keep talking about resilience, like you're going to build your way out of this. And there is no building your way out of this. We have to figure out how to move 40 million Americans inland. <clears throat> we have to figure out how to move 40 million Americans inland. This is not an issue of, um, of building, you know, buildings that can handle flooding a little bit better or can handle a hurricane. And so that's what I want to talk to you about. This is Miami. Miami is kind of a special uh, condition. It's more or less the exception that proves the rule because in Boston or in New York, we can do what they've been doing for centuries in the Netherlands. We can build a wall to keep the sea level rise out. But Miami has a, uh, a geology that's porous. And so if we build a wall up, it doesn't matter because the sea seawater can move underneath the wall um, through all the little uh, limestone caves and still get into the city either which way. And so it's going to look, you know, a kind of worst case scenario, it's going to look something like this. And so the question is kind of what happens? What happens when, um, when it looks like this? And actually, the thing I'm kind of interested in is what happens before it looks like that? Because really, the entire real estate market, as far as I can tell, is a big pyramid scheme. Everyone counts on buying something knowing that they can turn around later and sell it. You're not buying a, a building or a house for use value only, although use value is a big part of it. You're buying it because you assume that it probably um, will gain value or at least won't lose too much value for you to sell it. Now, <clears throat> that all works as long as you can sell it to someone who can sell it. In other words, if I am going to buy it now, I have to, if I'm going to pay that much money for it, the whole system is set up. So I'm assuming that I can sell it to someone and that they want to buy it. And the reason they want to buy it is they can sell it to someone. So even if this is 75 years away, if you assume I'm going to keep it for 35 years, and then I'm going to sell it to someone in 35 years, suddenly 75 years away does not seem like a very big deal. And so I've been kind of fascinated with real estate values, coastal real estate values, especially in a place like Miami, where there's no way really as far as we know right now to keep the rising sea level out. And really, the most of the experts right now think it's it's not a matter of just reducing our carbon, which is very important, but there's so much carbon in the air. And actually, 50%, um, you know, we, I think we think of it as like this long term thing. Um, uh, this kind of, you know, over the entire from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in the 1850s or whatever, uh, until now, these, you know, 175 years, but actually, just in one generation, just since 1990, um, in the last 30 years, that's more than half of the carbon that's in the air. So things are not getting better, they're getting worse. Um, and most people think that our only hope is some kind of a geoengineering solution, either like a giant reflector that's going to orbit, and reflect some of the sun over the Pacific, or aerosolized sulfur dioxide that's going to reflect some of the sun. Something where we're 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 kind of cooling we're cooling the Earth in a man-made kind of way, and and uh, <clears throat> and when that happens, when the when the so even if the even if the sea level rise doesn't come, and I'm not sure if it's gonna if we're gonna fix it in time or not. Even if the sea level rise doesn't come, um, the uh, the risk, as far as I can tell, is that the entire real estate market and coastal communities around the world is going to collapse decades before the actual um, the actual rising sea level because you'll have a situation. I hope I'm wrong, but you'll have a situation um, where buying coastal property will be seen by the educated citizenry the way that buying uh, timeshare is right now seen by the educated citizenry. It's kind of seen as on average a ripoff. So <clears throat> that's what we're going to talk about today. We're not going to talk about uh, climate change, although I have a good book for you um, called The Uninhabitable Earth uh, uh, by, well, it's this guy. Hold on. I'm blanking on his name. Something, uh, David Wallace Wells. 
Um, this is from an article he wrote, but I'm also reading his book. So in Miami right now, and that's where I was, I was found all those articles because I was looking for, um, I was looking for, I've been looking at the in Miami for a while and I was looking for um, an article I'd seen saying that the higher elevations in Miami um, were increasing in property value 7% faster than the lower level elevations. Uh, but I never found that actual number again, but I think it's out there. So I think it's 7% already. Um, but that to me seems really low. Um, and then there's this kind of sea level rise map viewer, which I encourage you guys to check out. You can just check it out now if you want, um, where you can, um, you can search it. NOAA puts it on the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. And so this is Miami and you can change the sea level rise to one foot and you can see what gets flooded two feet. Um, here's now three feet. Uh, and you see the, the blue in here. Four feet. So Miami Beach and the coast water, coastal area of Miami is, is underwater. And this is five feet and five feet's about kind of the, definitely not the worst case scenario. It could go much higher than that, but uh, five feet is, is kind of the, um, it's still very much within the likely possibility, but it's kind of towards the upper end of the likely possibility by 2100. So this is what we have to look forward to. All right. So that's why, you know, one of the many reasons <laughs> on that happy note, why we want to talk about topography and topography. So what we're looking at a topo map, we're looking at lines of equal elevation and, <clears throat> and they're kind of fun to read and they're kind of fun to make, <laughs> um, but they can be a little confusing at times. And so you just have to kind of remember that these are lines of equal elevation. And then if you're going uphill or downhill, you're generally going perpendicular um, to the lines to go uphill or downhill. So it's up to you to figure out if you're going uphill or downhill. So this one is an elevation of 550 feet. This up here is an elevation of 575 feet. Here is also an elevation of 575 feet, and it goes down in between, back down to 550 right here and right here. So we have a house, and we you can see that at 575 here and 550 at the house, there's going to be water moving down through the uh, down the hill, and it's going to be moving into the house. And so we need to kind of do something about that. And so we have to regrade and we're going to regrade something like this. The idea is we're going to put the house on a bit of a mound and we're going to create what's called a swale where we're going to redirect the water around and we'll zoom into that so you can see it a little better. But um, um, we're going to take the water like this and we're going to redirect it around. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the contour lines from the downhill side. We're going to kind of etch them up a little bit. And then we're going to do it again. Back in the old days in ARE 4.0, you actually had to do this. You had to make a, a swale as part of the um, vignette for the, uh, for the ARE 4.0. That's not required anymore. All right. So, um, there's a big banner. I'm just reading some of the um, text. Hello, Tyler. There's a big banner of the host muted uh it's perfect now okay we're good all right so and that looks kind of like this so if we zoom into um you know every two feet resolution or so for these contour lines you see that the house itself the building itself is on a mound <clears throat> that's a bit higher than the land around it and then there's going to be this this um this recontouring of the land that looks something like this and the water is then going to go down the hill and it's going to go around the house and not not up against the wall of the house because we don't want it to and it'll look something like this hopefully all right now your next assignment is to draw the path of water runoff so draw the path of water runoff if you have this printed out great you can draw it right on it um, it probably doesn't work just to kind of mentally draw it. Although if you have to, if you're in a pickle and that'll do, if you're near a printer and you haven't printed it out, you might want to print this out. So we'll get back together in about two and a half minutes and we'll see, uh, we'll see what you got.
you can put arrows all over this thing. Not just for the, you know, so the question is draw the path of water runoff. I didn't just mean for the house, I mean for the whole, the whole locality. All right, <clears throat> so what we want to do is we want to kind of figure out where the water is running. So it's good to kind of make um, arrows that are perpendicular to the um, that are perpendicular to the uh, contour lines to think about how the water is going to move. And then sometimes it's going to kind of move down and then keep moving out. And sometimes it's going to move down and then just move down. It's just going to wind up staying right in this area. So if you look at all of the water, the flow of the water, it would look something like this. Uh, so we have um, uh, water moving down this way, every, every which direction from here. We have it moving from here down this way towards the house or proposed side of the house, next to the house, and it's gonna go down here. And here it's moving in here and here. All right, let's do another problem. Identify the peak of the hill. Go ahead and this shouldn't take a long. I'm just gonna give you about 20 seconds. All right, the peak of the hill that we see is right here. Anytime we see a circle like you see here or here, it's either the lowest point or the highest point um, in that immediate area. <clears throat> because again, it's an equal contour all the way around. And so um, in this case, this one is going to be the peak of the hill. All right, our next assignment is to identify the gully or the local low point and the valley. So there's a gully. Um, that may or may not be filled with water. And there's a valley uh, where the water kind of runs down to in the stream. Go ahead and see if you can figure those out. I'm going to give you about 35 seconds. So some of you guys in the chat are asking about this. Yeah, that would be just as good an answer. Um, so here is a peak and here is probably a peak as well. It, though it may keep going up from there for all we know. It may keep going up to 750 feet. Um, but yeah, that would have been an acceptable answer as well. All right, so in this case, we're looking for the gully and the local low point. The, the gully and the local low point is here. So there's likely or possibly, at least when it rains, gonna be a pond or at least a lot of puddling there. Uh, the valley is kind of down here. So as the water comes down here and comes down here, it's gonna go down to the valley. All right, uh, and you see it kind of moving down the valley as it flows down. And then again, we'll just assume there's kind of a pond in here. Um, all right, oops. All right. Well, if you were asked, like, where is a retention pond or where's a catch basin? And a retention pond is just what you think it is. A catch basin is one of these, you know, so it's what you might have called a drain before you became an architect. Um, and then underneath here, there's usually one of these. So there's basically a plastic or metal or concrete, often concrete um, box that um, can handle a whole lot of runoff at once. And then it goes to a pipe which go, continues downhill until it hits daylight or a pump or something like that. And so if we're asking ourselves, um, where would a catch basin be or where would a retention pond be, you would want to put the drain, you know, somewhere here, maybe a linear drain uphill of the house. So if there was a lot of, um, if there was a lot of rain, we'd put it there. Or if we didn't want a retention pond here because of mosquitoes or something like that, 
we could put a catch base in here and then uh, and then maybe we take it downhill from there. Um, uh, uh, any water that accumulated, we just take downhill from there underground and bring to daylight. All right, go ahead and see if you can identify the ridge line. All right, the ridge line, there's a peak here, and there's probably a peak either here or somewhere off the screen, off the screen. And kind of the ridge line, the high line, high point is going to be something like this. It's going to dip down, but it's still the highest point around right here. And then it's going to kind of come back around through here. So this that's the ridge line. And now your final assignment is to draw the lines that indicate the cone of the obscured western view as experienced by the occupants of the house. So in other words, the house is blocked, its view is blocked. And the question is, um, uh, the question is, how is the, uh, how is the view, the Western view from that house blocked? What's the cone of obstruction? I'll give you a little while to think about this one and uh, I'll give you about a minute and a half. So here are all our answers at once. Um, here's our local low point. Here's our the top of the hill and our ridge line. Um, and yes, you could probably argue that this is a top of the hill too. Here's our valley. Now you can assume that these keep coming down. If you don't see otherwise, you can assume that if it goes from here down, it's gonna keep going down. And um, although of course it could theoretically go back up, but that's not really the way it looks like uh, if you can kind of picture the contouring of the land. And then someone asked, what about in the south of the site? Should we, put a, um, should we put a drain there? No, it keeps going down from there, you can assume. Um, so really you wanna put a drain anywhere where it's uphill of a building or it's the lowest point around that it's made kind of a circle like we see here. And the area of the obscured view um, if you look here, it's 550 feet. So kind of everything above 550 feet, well, maybe you're a little taller because you have a few feet standing on that, but is going to be obscured as part of the Western view. So all this is kind of helpful for PA. A saddle looks something like this, just like you'd think a saddle would. So this right here is a saddle where you have the ridge here and you have the ridge here. So the water comes down here and down here, but then it doesn't stay. It goes that way and that way. Just like here, it comes down here and down here, but then it comes down here and around the other side as well. All right, this is our assignment for next week. Um, the, this is actually from the new, uh, and it may be on the old one, but I don't think so, the new um, NCARB demonstration exam. So what I want all you guys to do for next week is, uh, and really you should all be doing this anyway. I mean, it's, it's by far the best practice test is the NCARB demonstration exam. Uh, if you wanna get familiar with kind of the pacing of the test and the software itself. And so what I want you to do is, I want you to do this question, but I also want you to just take that test if you have time. And what I can do is um, if you wanna take that test, if you have, questions during the week and you're like, I just don't get why the answer to this is this, then what I want you or what the answer to this is, what I want you to do is email me. And if I get a bunch of emails for one particular question, I'll know to cover that the following week. 
So to get to the NCARB demonstration exam, as you probably know, you sign into my NCARB. And on the right hand side, it says uh, uh, ARE 5.0 uh, demonstration exam. The new one is the ARE 5.0 demonstration exam. I forgot what but with whiteboard or, you know, or, or new software or whatever. That's the one you want. Uh, you want the new one because the old one has maybe only 15 questions or something, but the new one has maybe 75 questions. So anyhow, go ahead and do that. But here's our question for next week. An architect is de detailing a two hour rated wall assembly between a lecture hall and lobby corridor for a new business school. Wall thicknesses needs to be minimized and acoustical separation between the spaces needs to be maximized. Which interior wall assembly is appropriate for this location? So it gives you four uh, it gives you four separate um, wall assemblies and you get to pick which one. All right. Uh, now there are some other questions. Actually, there were a lot of questions from last week that I promised to answer. So I want to go over those. One is, does ADA require the corridor to be corridor to be 60 inches for a wheelchair turnaround? No, I looked into it. ADA requirement minimum for a corridor, believe it or not, is only three feet. So your corridor is given that the corridor for uh, any kind of a large building, any kind of an occupancy that's not like single family detached residence or really small occupancies, the minimum size corridor is gonna be 44 inches or um, <clears throat> 0 0.2 times the occupancy load using the corridor for sprinklered, 0 0.3 times the occupancy load for the corridor unsprinklered. And those are gonna control in almost every setting. Now um, you can imagine like in aisles in between something within a room uh, that 36 inches may control. But um, generally, it's going to be for most of the bigger buildings you do, it's going to be 44 inches or the occupancy load times the coefficient. Our next question, why is it a business area? So you might remember we looked at a um, uh, we looked at a uh, conference room and we decided it was a business classification and not an assembly, even though it was a large conference room. And uh, this person said, I've always calculated occupancy of conference rooms as assembly spaces. Would you please explain why it was business? And so it's, it's one of those things where it's just an exception in the rule. In 303.1.2 small assembly spaces, it reads the following rooms and spaces shall not be classified as assembly occupancies. A room or space used for assembly pur pur purposes with an occupant load of less than 50, you'll remember ours was uh, less than 50, it was 49 persons and accessory to another occupancy like ours was um, in our case ours was an office so it was a b or business occupancy class shall be classified as group b which again is that business occupancy or as part of that other occupancy and so um so i you know i know some of you um if you have a big conference room like something that needs multiple uh, uh multiple entrances that has more than 50 people it, it often will fall, probably always will fall under assembly. But if it's a small conference room, it can fall under business or under whatever the, you know, mercantile, if it was a, you know, a, a, you know, a store or something, for, for some reason, a store had a conference room in the back or something, um, maybe it would fall under uh, M. Anyhow, um, in general, don't worry about that stuff. It's not that you can't get something like that on a test. It's just that it's unlikely that the exception will be what you need and that you won't find it. And even if there is an exception like that, then they would have to include chapter 10, where the base kind of stuff we were looking at was, and they'd have to include chapter three, <laughs> um, where this uh, classification is. And it's just unlikely that'll be a problem. I'm not saying it won't be. I'm just saying it's not a good yield to spend your time uh, stressing out about exceptions to code it's hard enough to learn the code uh, much less learn the exceptions but yes a, a conference room is often an assembly if it's big but if it's small it's not all right um let's see um someone said someone wrote a really good question said you asked about travel distance why not use table uh 1017.2 so again for those who were here last week you'll remember we were trying to figure out this distance from the farthest point in the room to here. And to do that, we used um, this table on the left. So we said, okay, we have a business occupancy. We have a maximum occupant load of 49. We have less than 49. 
and you could see the maximum common path of egress, tra egress travel, which is distance in feet. In our case, because it was sprinklered, is going to be 100 feet. So what we said was that this, even though it's drawn on this, uh, um, uh, on this uh, plan to be a bit more than 100 feet, um, uh, it would the limit would be 100 feet. Uh, and that 100 feet by this particular uh, table, by this table uh, 1006.2.1, is the distance to where you have two choices to run out of the building. However, um, this other table, the one that this person was asking about, uh, is a, if you look at this, it says for a business occupancy uh, with the sprinkler system, we have 300 feet. And this is the exit access travel distance. Now, what does that mean? Um, it frankly is probably a little bit more relevant than the one I use, which is spaces with one exit or access doorway. So this is a pretty particular one that's only valid when we're talking about the common path of egress travel for spaces with one exit or exit uh, access doorway. So we're talking about in that case, there's only one door and so we want to make sure that everyone doesn't just like get trapped in, in fire. So we have a maximum there. But the, um, the, ma the other one, the one that she asked about, table 1017.2, is looking at exit access travel distance. And exit access is basically the length of the hallway until you get to the stair. So we have there, we have the exit, and this is from the Amber book. Uh, right now we have the exit access and we have the exit and the exit discharge. The nomenclature is really confusing. Um, and it throws people off all the time because there's the exit is the stair, the exit axis is the corridor, and the discharge is the exit from the stair. Now, the particular um, example I gave last week said it was a single story. So that 300 feet is actually the distance in that case to get outside because it's on the first floor. But if it was on the 15th floor, that distance at 300 feet would essentially be the corridor, it's the exit axis. So basically, how long you have 300 feet or less to get to a stair. Uh, that's the maximum in that particular table. All right. Um, all right, someone asked, do you need a certain score in each section of the division to pass? Or is it just a certain number of que questions cumulative, cumulatively to pass? I, I've covered this on a previous um, 40 minutes of confidence, but it's been several months. And so there's probably a bunch of people who weren't there then. And so what we're talking about here is we're talking about the fail report. So you get a fail report from NCARB and it's not only unclear, it's actually downright misleading. <laughs> so it makes it look like, so they break it down into these five sections, one, two, three, four, five. And they break it down into these four levels, level four, three, two, and one, level one being the best, um, uh, and level two being not as good. And then they make it look with having the blue and the gray, they make it look like you have to be blue in every section. In reality, that's not true. You could fail every question in a, in a this is the, the section percentage. So this is how much of the exam division is that particular content area. So content area five is between two and 8%. So it may just be two items. And so you could get both those items wrong and get the lowest kind of fail on that one. And it likely would not uh, affect whether or not you pass the whole thing. Um, so every question is worth one point. There's a cut score, which is the minimum score you need to pass. And, and let me say this, because you guys won't believe me, but I'm telling you, it does not matter where your questions get come from. It does not matter what section. There are two problems with the way that they present this. The first problem is they make it look like you have to pass every section when you don't. And the second problem is they kind of make it look like there's equal weighting, even if you, you know, know how to read it. If you just look at it graphically, it makes it sound like these five are equal weight, weighting. But there's 2% to 8% here. But these first two sections combined are like between two thirds and three quarters of the test. Look, this first one is 31 to 37%. The second one is 32 to 38%. So I guess there's three problems to this. So, um, so, um, so all these combined, maybe, you know, a third or even a quarter of the test, these last three combined. So in general, you want to, you want to focus not just on the ones that you struggled with, according to this graph, or according to this um, graphic, 
but you want to you want to focus on the ones that you struggled with and that are worth a lot because that's the place where you can get the most benefit. So you look at this and you say, oh, I did really bad on this one. But you say, well, it's only 12 to 18%. That's not a little bit of the test, but that's not a lot either. Let's see what it is. Oh, look, it's manual and specifications. That doesn't seem that hard to study. I probably could learn a little bit more about that. So that's what I'm going to study for the retake. But if you look here, where you got code, that's between 8 and 14% of the test. So let's call it 10% of the test. And its code area is code, its content area is codes. Well, man, that is a lot to study for 10% of the exam content. So um, your yield would probably not be well spent studying codes. So the third problem with this is, let's say you saw this and you said, okay, 31 to 37%, level three, this is one area that I want to study. Even though I understand that if I had gotten one more question here in this category, it would be worth as much as if I got one more question here in this category. So what does that mean? Well, I say, okay, now I want to study content area one, integration of building materials and systems. What? You're telling me I need to study integration of building materials and systems for PPD or PDD? That is PDD. Like, <laughs> That's that's such a broad area. That's everything from roofing to enclosure to structures to lighting to acoustics to thermal to HVAC and on and on wood and stone and uh, oh my lord. So the idea that you're getting a level three here, this is completely useless. And actually, um, NCARB had a bunch of us who do test prep up to world headquarters of NCARB back in 2015-ish. Uh, and it was March, I think, of whatever year that was. I think it was 2015. Um, and they pointed this out, that they were changing the categories. The, the category, the content areas used to be things you could study, like plumbing or lighting or wood. But now they're so vague as to be kind of meaningless. And I actually raised my hand at one point. And I said, how would anybody who, who failed this particular section know what to study afterward? And they kind of said, yeah, that's a good point. Um, but they never changed it. So, um, uh, uh, so uh, if you're talking about something like this, which is, you know, like this person did really poorly in cost estimating. So maybe even though it's two to 8%, maybe you might go through the NCARB demonstration exam, and you would look for something that was cost estimating. Now, generally, these are questions that are long on common sense and easy to screw up if you read it too fast. So in this particular one, again, from NCARB's demonstration exam, it says an architect has received a construction cost estimate for 85,000 square, gross square foot elementary school that is $420,000 over the construction budget. All right, 420,000 over the construction budget. Um, the owner requests that the current brick veneer cavity wall system with a metal stud backup. So we're talking about brick veneer uh, cavity wall system where the, the brick sits on top of the other brick. And then there's a capillary break airspace, and then there's a steel stud. Um, and there's a way for the water that gets down here to go down. There's a, uh, there's an enclosure on the outside of the steel stud. And that water is going to eventually go down to flashing and a weep hole. And so it's saying, okay, we need to save some money. So the owner requests that the current brick veneer cavity wall system with metal stud backup be replaced with a more cost effective system. So they blew the budget, and they have to figure out what to do. And then this is important, while maintaining a similar exterior aesthetic. So they want something that looks like brick, that's going to be really important. It's kind of obvious should be the contractor has provided pricing for alternative exterior systems. Based on this pricing information, what system should the architect recommend to the client. So I'll let you kind of stew on this for a minute and see if you can figure it out. All right, well, let me give you one more minute. All right, so now 
um, we look and we say, okay, this is what's it giving us? It's giving us the quant. This should be pretty obvious, but I'm going to show you why it's easy to screw this up. Um, so it says the quantity is 30,000 square feet. That's the square feet, of course, of the envelope of the facade, not the square foot of the building, which is 85,000 square feet. And the unit cost in dollars per square feet is 60 for our, um, for our existing plan of brick veneer, cavity, wall, metal stud backup. So if you multiply 30,000 times 60, uh, you're going to get um, 1.8 million, something like that. Um, so $60 per square foot. Um, and so what you need is you need a replacement. Now, if you're in a hurry, you're going to see that this is cheaper. That's good. And that this has thin brick on with a metal stud backup. And you're going to, if you're in a hurry, uh, which is one of the advantages of the new test, which will give you a little more time per question, you're going to go with that one. But, but that's a trick because um, this one is precast concrete insulated panels with a thin brick exterior finish. So in this case, they put the thin brick on the end of the line, descriptive line. And in a hurry, you might just take the thin brick at the beginning. And you see this one is cheaper still. So it goes from 49 to 42. And the whole thing is silly, right? They say we're 420,000 over. So what do we do? Well, if you multiply the $11 savings, um, between 60 and 49 is $11 times the 30,000 square feet, you only get $330,000 of savings, but you need 420,000. So what they want you to pick is they want you to pick this one, um, which is uh, a $18 per square foot savings, which more than clears the necessary $420,000 we want to save. So it's a bit of a silly question. It's one that you could obviously handle if you had an unlimited amount of time. And if you actually had, you know, kind of looked at each option. So um, the choices are exterior insulation and finish system, EFIS metal stud backup. EFIS, if you don't know, it looks kind of like cheap, cheap ass stucco. It's something we've covered in, in previous um, uh, courses. And those courses, as you probably know, are available in, um, at least for a little while, they're available on YouTube. Um, this is number 34. And after 40, I'm still going to keep doing these, but I'm not going to put them on YouTube anymore. So, um, uh, so we're in the final ones that are going to be available on YouTube. All right. Um, uh, exterior insulation finish system is stucco. It's not that because that doesn't look even though that's cheap, uh, $20 a square foot, one th fully one third of the cost of um, the our original plan. Um, it doesn't look like brick. And they said they wanted something that looks like brick. Precast concrete insulated panels with a form, a form liner exterior finish. Form liner exterior finish just means that the, it's just what it sounds like. It means that the form that, that cast the concrete panels um, are, um, have a texture to them, like a pattern in the form. And so the concrete has a pattern or a texture on it. But that of course also doesn't look like brick. Um, the thin brick on thin set mortar with the metal stud backup, that seems like it would be the right answer until you realize that the numbers don't quite work out. And you realize that there's another one with thin brick on the end of the, um, on the end of the description. So that's going to be your correct answer. All right. Um, this is one, one we made for fun. Um, this is not a fail report from NCARB. This is our own version. It's a pass report from NCARB. And it looks like a fail report, but you look a little bit more closely and you see missed opportunity one is social events and keeping up with friends. Uh, you didn't do so well on that one. Uh, missed opportunity two is quality time with your family. Did a little better with that one. Missed opportunity number three is sleep. You got a level four on that one. Missed opportunity number four is exercise. You could have done better on that one. And personal projects, you did okay, but not quite as well as you would want. And so, we make this as kind of a tongue in cheek way to say, look, there is a problem if you fail. Um, and it's a big problem. But there's also a problem if you overstudy if you pass, but you give up all of these things to pass when you maybe didn't need to. So I think people assume that if they passed, they did everything exactly right. And then if they fail, they did everything wrong. And in reality, it's much more probabilistic than that. And winners think probabilistically. And so um, what you want to do is you want to get to your to a point where you have a high likelihood of passing, but not to the point where you've lost your friends and your family and your sleep and your health. 
you want to get to the point where uh, you're likely to pass and then take the test. Because what happens is people overstudy, pass the test and then say to themselves, I need, I'm glad I studied that much. When in reality, that may or may not have been true, you don't know. All right. That concludes the programmatic portion of our Amber book, 40 Minutes of Competence. I'm going to make it so you guys can unmute yourselves and you can ask me questions and I'll do my best to answer them. And as you know, if I can't answer them, I'll do my best to find out for next week. Um, hi, this is Rebecca. I, I have a question about accessibility ramps. Sure. Um, I've always read that you needed um, a five foot clearance for a landing, right? Five feet, but that the width could be at least the minimum 36 inches wide. Then I read in a book over the weekend that it had to be, that landings for accessibility ramps had to be 60 by 60, like five feet in both directions. Right. Is that true? So it depends whether the ramp changes direction. So if you have a ramp that's kind of goes up, that's a very steep ramp I drew. <laughs> that doesn't meet the one to 12. And then goes over and then goes up again. So in plan, it looks something like this. It can be thinner. It can be whatever the thinnest is. I, I don't think it's, it, maybe it's 36 inches. For some reason, I thought it was 44. But, um, but whatever that dimension is, um, it can be thinner than the five feet wide. If, however, you have a, a ramp that goes like this in plan, where it comes down, say it comes down here, and then the person in the wheelchair has to turn around and then goes down this way, then for obvious reasons, you need a wider uh, turning area. And that width then has to be at least, at least 60 inches, I believe. If I'm wrong, someone can mention it in the, uh, in the, in the, in the um, chat. It's always hard, always hard to do code things from my head. Um, yeah, I know, <laughs> me too. Yeah. yeah, I guess it makes sense if it's turning. Yeah. Um, Okay, thank you. Yeah, that's one again, that's one of the problems. If you got that, if you got that from a this is the problem with material that is text based, it should be visual. <laughs> you know, we're architects and it's frankly cheap and easy to make questions that are uh, if you saw it in a practice question, it's cheap and easy to make text based practice questions. I could make 50 a day. Um, if you have to kind of make videos or 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 animate the videos or actually draw these things out, it becomes much more difficult. Uh, but much more clear. Um, so I would kind of be on the lookout for whatever that particular source is. If there's lots of places like that where they're using text where in reality they should be using visual and, and frankly, NCARB is not so bad anymore. Uh, they use visual a little bit more than they used to. They used to use a lot of text where they shouldn't. They were kind of lazy about making the drawings, but they're not anymore. Um, and so it's, it's just a good thing to be used to, you know, kind of having some level of clarity. Now, NCARB's drawings are usually, I mean, this is probably the best drawing NCARB's ever made, this particular one that's on the screen. As you've seen, if you've taken these exams, <laughs> their drawings are like what Microsoft Paint used to be, but no longer, you know, even Microsoft Paint looks down on NCARB's drawings, um, but that's the regime we have. All right, I have time for one more. Hi, Michael, this is me. Um, I was wondering if you know um, when they ask like um, placing a building on a site, are they are we expected to rotate it? Because I only found that out maybe last. Right. I don't know. I found that out with a video, but yeah, that is really a problem. So for those of you who don't know, um, you know, in general, I'm not a big fan of uh, of talking too much or spending too much effort and time and and your study resources talking about test strategies with three exceptions. One is um, you have to move fast. Um, again, beginning soon, um, you won't have to move as fast because they won't have as many exam questions. Excuse me, but you have to move fast. Uh, right now, the current regime is if you give yourselves two minutes per question for the non-case studies and four minutes per question for the case studies, you should be able to finish the exams on time. And so when they've given a few fewer questions, that's still probably a reasonable goal, but just one you'll have to stress a little bit less about keeping in terms of pacing. So the first, there's three things that I recommend in terms of, I'm going to tell them all to you now, and then you really don't have to worry about the test format anymore. Um, but the three things you should know 
are number one, uh, you have to move fast and you want to get used to um, going about two questions, two, two minutes per question for everything that's not case study and four minutes per question for the case studies. Number two um, is that you need to use the search and use it smartly uh, for um, the uh, for the any kind of case study or code stuff in case study or anything in case study. Um, and you when, by smartly, I mean, if it um, uh, the example I think I gave last time was if the question is about parking, uh, how many parking spaces you need for the zoning in a bowling alley, don't search the word parking, search the word bowling, because parking is going to be in there 50 times and bowling is going to be in there once. Um, and so the, 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 uh, someone told me, I think in last week's um, installment of 40 Minutes of Competence, someone told me that the, um, that the, uh, uh, the search the search bar is on the top in the practice exam and on the bottom in the real exam or vice versa. So, you know, kind of be aware that there's a search bar for those PDFs and use it liberally. Don't browse when you can search. Your kids know this, your younger colleagues know this. If you're a young colleague, you know this. Don't browse when you can search. I cannot stress that enough. And then finally, yeah, it's like an Easter egg for a video game. Um, if you are dragging something that can be rotated, if you right click it, it'll rotate it 90 degrees. So right clicking rotates. It's pretty rare where you, I wouldn't say rare, yeah, it's maybe once for every two exams that I came across or once for every three, so maybe twice out of the entire six where I needed to rotate it. And if you right click on it, it will rotate it by 90 degrees. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Good night, get licensed.